Hey everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, experts from Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journey in this growing industry, giving you some insights on the ecosystem to hopefully help you to take part in the climate change fight and benefit from the opportunities that it can also represent. The podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speaker, their perspective on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. The second part of the talk will be for all members of the community who will learn from the speakers their secret sauce on how to, sharing with you their unique expertise on various topics as fundraising, management, strategy, and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. Let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. During this new episode of Founder Series, we are sitting down with Ryan Betancourt, CEO at Wild Earth, managing partner at Sustainable Food Venture and partner at Babel Venture. I was super excited to get Ryan on the show as he's a pioneer in the biotech movement in Silicon Valley. Over and above his incredible founder story, Ryan also has experience as a successful serial angel and venture investor in future of food and future of biotech companies, making him a special guest able to give insights from both sides of the fundraising table. In the show, we will cover with Ryan the unique story of the Wilder team who are developing clean protein pet foods that are healthier for your pet, better for the environment, and more humane than conventional products. And this is an industry with a big opportunities for decarbonization, as more than 25% of meat produced in the US goes to animal food. During the second part of the talk, Ryan will give his secret sauce for early stage founders seeking to fundraise. And finally, he will share with you his view on the opportunities that the climate tech ecosystem represents today. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. We are super happy and excited to have you uh, here with us uh, today. So uh, before we start, can you give us a 30 second intro about uh, Wild Earth? Again, yes, Wild Earth is the leading plant-based uh, pet food company in the U.S. and now, interesting enough, in India as well. Fantastic. So let's start by the top. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, your story and, uh, and background? Uh, maybe anything specific that you want to share uh, that is not public yet? I mean, what do you like? Uh, who, is, uh, who is Ryan, I would say? Yeah, and then yeah. we, can, uh, we can probably make the, the link uh, the, of your story that uh, was the, the driver to jump into this uh, more impact uh, industry. Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the things in the U S people know me as the CEO of wild earth. So I was on shark tank and, you know, 3.7 million people saw me going to shark tank, but I guess what people know a little bit less is what really got me interested in plant-based pet food um, and, and, you know, really growing wild earth out. And it was actually um, my, my work as uh, both as, as part of the biohacker movement, which is Basically, uh, when, when biotech companies in the last Great Recession started to go bankrupt, myself and, and several other people uh, started to buy used lab equipment uh, from biotech companies and make little labs in our, in our kitchens, in our dining rooms, in garages, um, you know, all, all across uh, the U.S. and the world as well, by the way. Um, and so that really inspired me to try and find a new path for scientists who wanted to be entrepreneurs like myself. Um, that led me to starting uh, a little lab on the outskirts of Berkeley called Berkeley Biolabs, um, which uh, was, a, you know, a, a decent little incubator. It was very cheap. We built it out of used lab equipment parts. My, my co-founder, Ron, would actually like rebuild some of the equipment because it just wasn't working. We would buy like broken equipment and we'd have to fix it. Um, but, but we learned a lot. And that led us to actually starting Indie Bio. Um, which is ba which was backed by SOSV and still still currently running. IndieBio is still the leading biotech accelerator. Um, but back then, what was really interesting is that you know, there's a lot of skepticism around scientists wanting to become entrepreneurs. And um, you know, most investors that I talked to were like, "Oh no, well scientists go into science to do science, not to start companies." And I was like, "No, scientists 
stay in academia because they don't have money to build the things that they want to build outside of academia. And it's very expensive and, and, and very difficult to become a PhD scientist, a postdoc, eventually a professor, um, you know, and you don't get paid well all the way through. So you can't take a risk and leave and go and start something because you just don't have the money. And so I think, you know, my, my thesis uh, around both Berkeley Bio Labs and Indie Bio was, well, if you gave scientists a bit of money to leave and start something that they'd been thinking about, I had this feeling that many of them had been thinking about, um, you know, new ways of applying science to create new types of innovations, new, new products, new services. Um, and, and the idea behind that was, well, actually, once we unleash that innovation, you know, science is the endless frontier. And so we'll release, you know, we'll, we'll accelerate an endless amount of innovation. Um, that led to IndieBio. Um, I was at IndieBio for four, four years. About 70% of the companies that we funded were gene therapy companies, cancer therapeutics, biomaterials companies. One of my favorite non-food companies was, uh, is Catalog Technologies. They store digital data and DNA. Um, so, you know, one of the things that blew my mind was that Intel told me um, when we had a conversation at Symbio Beta, that they uh, that we were running out of silicon, we couldn't pull enough silicon out of the ground to store data, and so you know that's why I was so glad that that uh, the founders of Catalog Technology applied. They store digital data in DNA. Uh, DNA is about a million times more data dense than silicon. So that was one of the mind blowing ideas that that really got me thinking. You know, this really is an endless frontier. Um, and then the other 30%, which I think is much more relevant to, to this podcast, you know, in, in climate tech, um, the other 30% was future of food. And at the time, you know, now this was, you know, nearly eight years ago, um, you know, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods weren't household names yet. They, they existed and Beyond Meat was doing some interesting stuff. Pat Brown at Impossible was, was apparently making some incredible burger that, you know, very few people had tried. Um, and... But the idea was, was really, you know, how we move the, the food system towards the future, whether it was plant-based. Uh, at the time, it was really a plant-based conversation. Um, and we, were the, we ended up, through IndieBio, we ended up being the first investors in Memphis Meats, now called Upside Foods, and helped, build, uh, helped Uma and the team build the company in the first four months of the existence of the company through the accelerator. Um, then we were the first investors in Finless Foods, cell-based fish. Uh, we were the first investors in uh, Notco, which is N-O-T-C-O, the Not Company. They're one of the leaders in Latin America and now in the U.S., uh, plant-based foods. Um, uh, Geltor, which brews collagen and, and gelatin. Uh, Clara Foods, which brews uh, egg whites. You know, and so all of these, you know, suddenly we found this very interesting niche, which was, you know, I myself was plant-based for everything, you know, for the animals, for the environment, for health. Um, and I never really imagined that I could combine my interests both in science and in, you know, better, cleaner, healthier, more sustainable food together. Um, and that really led to, I think, some of the innovations as well as, I guess, what was happening in the Bay Area at the time led to just these incredible companies that have now kind of emerged. And so that's really what, what set the setting for me when I was thinking about, you know, uh, pet food. I, I had this misconception that it was waste. So I had this misconception that pet food was waste. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized it was not waste. 25 to 30 percent of the meat we consume in the U.S. goes to our pets. Um, uh, if if the, U the United States dogs and cats were their own country, they would be the fifth largest consumer of meat. Um, it's, we're, we're, our, the growth rate in Europe and the U.S. is 4.5 percent year on year in terms of pet population. In India and China, the growth rate is 20 percent year on year. So as, as countries get richer, they get more pets, right? And so, um, you know, and I, the more I thought about it, I was like, no one's thinking about the next billion dogs and cats and how we're gonna feed them. They, they typically eat meat two times a day for years on end. And so I was like, the next, it's another billion mouths uh, that we've got to feed and how are we gonna feed them? And so I realized this was this huge need. And in the US in particular, there were a lot of food safety issues. So there've been uh, millions of units that are recalled because they're, they're Dog food had had euthanasia drug with contaminated meat and um, salmonella had been found, melted plastic had been found by the FDA in the food, all sorts of horrible things. You know, I'm a longtime pet parent myself. I have a 12 year old senior dog lady. Uh, she's a German shepherd, very sweet. Um, and I, I just wasn't happy with the food that was available for all of us, you know, all, the, all of our pets and, and all the pet parents 
uh, who really cared about health and sustainability. And so um, about four years ago, I decided that I wanted to change that and started Wild Earth with my co-founders. And so I've been on this journey for the last four years. And at first people were like, this is crazy. Dogs are carnivores. And it's like, no, that's actually not true. From a scientific perspective, dogs are omnivores like us. And what's even more interesting is they basically co-evolved with us. And so right now, the, you know, from a, from a paleobiology perspective, we're not sure if they, if they co-evolved with us from 10,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. And to give you a perspective of time, our species, Homo sapiens, is only about 200,000 years old. So maybe for a quarter of our existence as a species, dogs have been with us. They've been eating whatever we've been eating. Like we eat, they eat, we eat, they eat. And so it totally made sense to me that they're omnivores too. And, and the fact that they can survive and thrive on a plant-based diet, a lot of people don't know this. The longest lived dog, her name was Bramble. She lived 27 years of age. Um, she, ate, uh, she ate lentils, rice, and yeast. And yeast is the primary protein source in wild earth, right? There was, there was a bit of thinking there, right? In terms of like, you know, w- w- what, do, what do we really think is special uh, about different types of proteins? And yeast, we think, is, is one of the really special ones. Um, and so, you know, to me, I felt it was a, an idea whose time had come. Um, and so, you know, we, we saw transformation. So that was four years ago. Since then, you know, we had the most successful IPO in 20 years beyond me. Um, And and now plant-based is definitely a thing for everything, right? So for the environment, for sustainability, for the animals, um, uh, for health. And so, um, you know, now that's kind of the landscape that we're in. It's super exciting. You Mm -hmm. know, Wild Earth has just grown incredibly quickly. And so um, one of the hardest things has been, you know, as you grow as a company and as a brand, how do you keep serving and catering to, to the next demographic of people that you're serving, right? So at first it was true believers, people who we didn't really have to sell, they got it. Plant-based dog food, great, I'm in. Um, and then there were people who were more skeptical, like, oh, well, how do you know it's good? How, aren't dogs carnivores? They're like, no, no, and there was educational pieces. And so now we're seeing that we just need to keep doing education as we continue to scale into larger and larger demographics. Mm-hmm. So... And I think you, you covered that already uh, a little bit, but uh, c- can you give me a little bit like uh, in terms of uh, statistics and data uh, regarding the, the plant-based pet food uh, landscape today? Are we like, what's the penetration of the, of the market it's uh, tiny. right now? Yeah, it's tiny. tiny. It's tiny. So in the U.S., estimates vary, but it's somewhere between 50 to $100 million per year, right? Roughly uh, the, the plant-based pet food market. And, and, you know, this is in the context of currently, it's about a $40 billion market just in the U.S. Pet food is about $40 billion just in the U.S., which is a massive market. Um, there was a Canadian study that was done. It was published um, in PLUS, which is an open source journal, uh, by some researchers in Canadian University. And they found that 35% of pet parents would be open to a plant-based diet, right? So, so to give you, you know, give you some context of the perspective, I mean, we're talking over $10 billion potential market opportunity from nothing right from 50 to 100 million dollars and so so we think that the opportunity is absolutely massive um it's one of the reasons why i celebrate like when a new plant-based uh, pet food company comes up i think there was just a one that just recently is getting ready to launch in the uk called omni um you know i, I celebrated because i was like the op- market opportunity is so massive um that you know we will all grow um and we all have the potential to become large companies within the space and so you know i'm, I'm just very excited about the the amount of growth that we have in front of us, um, mm. you know, Wild Earth has grown hundreds of percent since our since the start, since our existence. We'll be releasing more data soon, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're actually just wrapping up a fundraise right now. And so, um, you know, it, it's very exciting. Like the future, you know, I would say that the growth rates that we've seen in plant based food for humans mm-hmm. is very similar, if not even more significant in, pe- in the pet food space. So before we go uh, into detail with uh, Wild Earth and, and how does it work, um, can you just give me the, 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 the link uh, in between the plant-based uh, pet food and the uh, potential impact uh, in terms of, uh, of solving or at least uh, mitigating climate change uh, and yeah. uh, reaching this uh, net zero goal that we are all, uh, all chasing uh, more and more? So what would need to happen to, to operate those, uh, those change at, at scale and how uh, plant-based pet food could contribute to that? Yeah, so the, the, the crazy part is that, you know, when you think about it, 
25 to 30 percent of the meat that's consumed in the U.S. and increasingly will be the case globally. You know, we've already seen that China has already really surpassed the U.S. in terms of number of dogs and cats. The market yet isn't as large, but it's growing dramatically. Um, 25 to 30 percent of the meat we consume in the U.S., goes to our pets. This is not waste. These are factory farmed animals. These are factory farms that are doing all the pollution, all the issues from whether you're talking about polluting wastewater to using land to uh, using cultivation land to grow the crops to feed the animals. Um, an incredibly inefficient way of creating protein, especially when you think that about 90% of the food that we're feeding our pets is kibble, little brown balls of protein. That's it, right? Which we can do with with yeast, we can do with plants, we can do, there's so many different ways we can actually do it. Eventually with cell-based meat, by the way, I'm very excited about cell-based meat and where we're going with cell-based meat, especially now that, you know, uh, Eat Just, I think they're now called Good Meats, um, got approval in Singapore. So now we have approved cell-based meat. We no longer have to contaminate, contaminate the environment or, or create a whole bunch of uh, greenhouse gases and pollution to grow meat. Um, and so, you know, this is very exciting, I think, for the direction that we're going in. But in terms of environmental impact, I mean, we can we can reduce the environmental impact of meat by 25 to 30 percent. I would make an argument. And this is what got me so excited about starting Wild Earth, that Wild Earth could have a bigger impact than either Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods individually or combined. Because, you know, you may have a burger once a week, twice a week, but your dog's going to eat two times every single day. Right. And so from from a sh the sheer perspective of making an impact, I mean, we've already um, Wild Earth has sold nearly 10 million meals. We fed 10 million meals um, since the year and a half that we've been in existence, nearly two years. So 10 million meals. So we've displaced the use of meat in 10 million meals, which I'm very excited about. Cool. So let's go a little bit deeper now into uh, into Wild Earth. And uh, thanks for already co covering the, the genesis of uh, of the the, the story uh, and the company. So, but how long did it take you guys to and your team to to put together the the, the first prototype or the first meal? Uh, and and what were the the, the challenges uh, in terms of like maybe sourcing the the, the, the raw material, the ingredients, and how do you ensure quality around that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a challenge. So it took us it took us a year and a half to actually make our product and manufacture it. Uh, honestly, much longer than I thought it would take. Uh, it was very complex. So so one week we had to make the formulas. We, we came across a whole bunch of issues. So we did we did what was the minimum required, which is like you have to have the minimum nutritional uh, uh, ingredients. Right. So you have to have the pr proteins in the right ratios over 18%, ours is 31%, so very high in protein. Uh, the fats, the carbohydrates, the vitamins, the minerals, those are the minimum. So that's, that's where it's required for an animal to survive and thrive minimum. And then we went beyond that and we we're like, well, what do, we, what do we think that with 21st century, both human nutrition and veterinary nutrition, we should be adding in here. So things like pre prebiotic fibers to feed the good bacteria in the gut, not required, but we added. We added in taurine, Uh, because even though dogs can make their own taurine, we think that it doesn't hurt to supplement it. Some older dogs make a little less taurine, so it's not going to hurt for them to have some additional taurine. We add in omega-3s and 6s for, for skin and, and brain health. Um, all these other things that are extra to base level uh, dog foods, and we, we developed it with a vet veterinarian, veterinary nutritionists, and scientists. So these were people who had deep experience, decades of experience in developing uh, pet food products because these have to be nutritionally complete. Unlike a, a, a plant-based burger, th that is not nutritionally complete. Wild Earth is nutritionally complete. So you can feed Wild Earth, just Wild Earth dog food to your dog forever, and your dog should stay healthy and get everything it needs to survive and thrive. And so, so that was really the starting point. And then this is where it got tricky. So now we had to test it. So it turns out we're 100, 100% cruelty-free company in the same way that you know, cosmetic brands do not test on lab animals nor do we. Uh, it turns out this is a huge problem in the pet food industry. Most people don't talk about this, that um, uh, many pet foods, when it says new flavor, new formula, those are actually tested on lab, lab dogs or lab cats. We don't do that. And so we had to come up with a new way of, of testing. And so we actually had the help of PETA, you know, the, 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 um, the animal charity, who actually connected us with, with different professors who actually helped us do um, volunteer testing at home. So we didn't have to use lab animals to actually develop our products. Um, and then we did all sorts of testing in terms of preferences, at home testing. 
uh, preferences, you know, feeding the dog food, checking to make sure the dog was happy and healthy uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, it took us a while to do that. So that, that took uh, actually many months. And then in terms of manufacturing, um, it turns out, and we found this out later, that uh, it's actually very hard to create a small pet food brand because you're, you're subscale. And so we had to find the right co-packers, which was very difficult, um, so that we could actually start producing our product at scale. Now we're at a you know, much larger scale than when we started, but when we started, it was very difficult to find a co-packer to work with um, because the idea of even plant-based dog food was just so bizarre to them that they were like, well, but why? Why would you do that? Like, we've got plenty of dog foods. Why would you do plant-based? And so, you know, there were a couple of like ethical conversations, you know, uh, sustainability conversations with different uh, manufacturers. Luckily, we found some great partners who've helped us along the way. Um, and then, and then of course it was launch, launching the product, getting us registered in all the States, all 50 States in the U S. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's definitely been a journey, um, in terms of getting, getting on some market. So a year and a half journey. And maybe, maybe it was just like, uh, an advertisement that you guys did, but I, I think I, I remember I saw a picture with you tasting your own dog food. Is that true? Yeah, or that was yeah, just yeah. for... No, I, I ate I ate six days worth of dog food in one sitting. Um, and, and, and the whole point behind that was really to make a statement that, you know, if it's not safe for you to eat, then why is it safe for your, for, for your dog? Like it doesn't make, you know, it, I mean, we're all animals, right? So the food should be safe for us, should be safe for them to eat. And so, um, you know, it was, it was part of an idea that we had uh, to really highlight the safety and the quality of our food to basically say, look, I believe in our food so much that I'm willing to eat it is the CEO of your dog food company willing to do the same. And, you know, and I, I challenged like the CEOs of Blue Buffalo, Pedigree, Purina to eat their own dog foods. We, we didn't hear anything back from them, by the way. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they didn't see the ad. Maybe they did. I don't know. Um, but, you know, but the, but the whole point was to basically say, look, we're plant-based, we're sustainable, we're a high quality product. I believe in it so much that I'm willing to eat it myself. Um, and, uh, and eat a lot of it. Um, and, and, and to me, that's important, right? Like I wouldn't want to feed anything to my dog that I don't feel is safe and high quality. And so, you know, that's been a huge problem in the U S we've had, uh, so many, uh, negative, uh, uh, quality issues with, with dog food over the years. And so I just really wanted to make the point with my team. We wanted to say, look, we are a different type of dog food company. We're not only are we healthy, you know, being plant-based, Uh, but we're also sustainable as well. So oh, and that, that's a, a terrible commitment that you did. I mean, terrible meaning like uh, congrats on doing that. Uh, and that's the best way to, to go. I, I got a lot of criticism, which was really funny. People <laughs> were like, you can't eat dog food. And I was like, why not? And they were like, you can't. And it's like, I can't eat dog food because most people know that it's not good. Most dog food is not good. That's not Wild Earth. Wild Earth is high quality, good stuff. That's why, that's why I'm making the statement. And so... You know, I think, I think people eventually, they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, we get it. We get it. <laughs> so wait, can you tell us a bit more about like, how do you source uh, the, uh, the different ingredients? Uh, part yeah. of your, um, how do you ensure the quality on that? Uh, so in, so in quality is that's... incredibly, yeah, quality is incredibly important for us. So we actually work with several partners in terms of now scaling the manufacturing of our brewing of our yeast. So, um, you know, because we, we now make, you know, uh, millions of pounds of dog food. And so, um, you know, we work with several partners in terms of the manufacturing of the yeast. We, uh, we, we have QC checks to make sure the amount of protein coming in is, 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 is appropriate. We also do uh, throughout the manufacturing process, we actually have multiple uh, quality control steps when we manufacture. We also have for most of our uh, manufacturing runs, we'll have a Wild Earth team member on site. Obviously with COVID, it was a little trickier. So we had to figure out how to, how to do remote monitoring. Um, but, but we typically have a, a Wild Earth team member on site as the manufacturing has happened. We think that's really important in terms of assuring quality of the product. And then at the end, um, my co-founder Brill, she ensures that um, she, she, she makes sure that we do a QC check on the dog food after it's completed and we hold different batches until they've been QC checked to make sure that they have the right nutritional completeness. Uh, the vitamin mineral premix is set at the right amount. All of these things are incredibly important for quality assurance. And so um, that we, we have multiple QC steps. And then the final step is we release it and then it goes to our warehouses where we actually ship to our, to our customers as well. So Wild Earth is available on wildearth.com, on Chewy and on Amazon as well. 
And it's like, a, if I'm don't mistake, it's like a subscription uh, based uh, product. Dog right? food. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what we found is that a lot, like the majority of our of our pet parents, once once the, once their dogs have tried uh, Wild Earth, as long as their dogs like the dog food, 90 percent do. Um, then what they actually find very convenient is just to have it on subscription. So every month you get, you get your bag of dog food arrives. I actually love it because I never have to go to the pet food store if I don't want to. Um, and so my wild earth arrives just as I have like a day or two left of food, my dog food arrives and that's it. I don't have to go anywhere. I can feed my dog. Um, and so, so yeah, so we're a subscription dog food company. What we found is that um, we, we really like that type of relationship that we have with our with our customers, we're always listening to our customers and trying to improve the customer experience. And we think that having a direct relationship like that is very powerful for you know an earlier stage brand like ourselves. I mean, we you know we're we're, we're large in terms of being the largest uh, plant based pet food company, but we are um, we are not large enough that that you know listening to our customers doesn't help us make better products or create better services. Yeah. And is it available? You said like uh, the US for sure. Uh, anywhere else like Europe? Yeah. Uh, maybe so, in the future? It, it, so Europe is definitely on the plans for the future. Uh, we've had multiple requests for uh, all across Europe, uh, Germany, the Nordics, uh, the UK, Israel. I know Israel's like kind of in and out, um, but uh, you know, Switzerland, like a whole bunch of France, Spain. So we've had a bunch of requests for Wild Earth. Um, we're working on that. We, we want to make sure we scale correctly here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and then actually, interesting enough, we are available with our partners in India, uh, Heads Up for Tails. So Heads Up for Tails in India, we are available. So for, for your listeners that are actually in India right now, uh, we, we market it as a vegetarian dog food. It's 100% plant-based. We market it as vegetarian. 80% of the market in, in India is actually vegetarian. Consumers are vegetarian. And so uh, many of them uh, didn't re even realize that a vegetarian dog food is available. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're now proud to be able to provide that option for them. And we're available on Heads Up for Tails. Cool. So can you tell us a bit more? And you already started to, to cover a bit, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper in terms of the competition today. Uh, that, yeah. uh, while I was, and I guess, like you mentioned in the UK, there's a new uh, company about to launch. So uh, how is the competition in, in, in the EU and the uh, and US and, and why you guys are, are maybe different or, or maybe better? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, the, so the first, the first thing, this is actually really important. So the first thing is, you know, we don't view ourselves as like a vegan brand, right? So the majority of our customers are actually not vegan or vegetarian. These are just people who care about healthier food and potentially more sustainable food. But that, that's actually a secondary concern. The first and foremost thing that they're concerned about is the health of their animals. And so we have some just incredible health data. We call it the wild earth effect. Um, you can actually check it out on our website and wildearth.com. Just check out the wild earth effect. And so, um, you know, we've seen it, uh, pet parents have self-reported an 86% improvement in, in the health of their animals uh, from those pet parents that have previously been feeding meat-based diets um, and switched over to wild earth. And so we really view ourselves in a class of our own in the sense that we are targeting, we are competing directly with blue buffalo um, Royal Canin. These are companies that we admire, but we think we can outcompete in terms of the high quality of our product and the healthiness of our product. Um, there are plant-based brands in the U.S. Some of them are family-owned brands. Some of them are individual lines of, uh, uh, of brands. So like um, Halo has a line, which is plant-based. Uh, Natural Balance has a line that's plant-based. Um, the U.K. actually has several plant-based uh, lines. Most of them, again, are family-owned and small. Um, and, and they're marketed very differently. And so they're marketed really, you know, vegan, vegan, vegan. So it's like, if you're vegan, I'm vegan, everyone should be vegan. Um, and, and what we found is that that just doesn't resonate with the majority of the population, right? There's, there's definitely, you know, I'm plant-based, I'm vegan, but I, I try not to preach about it because I realize that that's not what's important. What's important is you care deeply about the health of your animal. Um, and, 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 and that's the starting point. And the fact that we've made a food that it's also sustainable, also good for the, all the animals. Like that's that's an extra benefit um, that we add on to the end rather than leading with that. So you, you mentioned uh, already the, uh, the the billion dollar uh, market opportunity uh, for the plant uh, pet based food, but. Um, how do you guys are planning to, to scale the operation? Because uh, definitely there is this whole logistics and, and production uh, involved. So what are the, the, the steps uh, in a way to, to achieve uh, that, uh, I would say, like 
maybe international or global scale uh, that you would like to to reach and what needs to happen to uh, to go to that uh, global uh, expansion i would say yeah m- many lessons i would say many lessons so i think for for many of your listeners who probably kind of thought thought a lot about and seen some of the growth of these brands um, you have to start small and so you have to do things there's a saying uh, from actually uh, Paul Graham, who's one of my, my favorite investors and innovators, um, do things that don't scale, right? And so consistently, we've done that with Wild Earth. So when we first started Wild Earth, we would, we would bake our, actually, when we first started Wild Earth, we would bake, bake our first prototype kibble in my co-founder's oven, Brill's oven. So <laughs> she, would, she would roll them herself, hand roll them, and then bake them in the oven. And then we'd test to see, you know, we would eat them, the dogs would eat them. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we started there and then we went into commercial kitchen and we started to produce both our treats and our food. We used to bake them. That wasn't very economical. You know, it was still very expensive for us. We were making a loss every time we'd sell it or at least breaking even. And so, you know, we had to do that to really prove out the market, to test the product. And then we were able to go into a co-packer and then really get some scale. You know, now the scale that we're at, uh, we've been able to significantly, um, improve our margins. So, you know, we are, uh, we have strong margins uh, as a company. That's really important when it comes to raising money. Um, for for the, those of your listeners who are like, okay, how do I build a company? It's like, the company has to make money. It has to make an impact, but it has to make money because that's how you, that's how you continue to make an impact. You have to, you have to, your product itself has to be profitable. Most companies as they scale are not profitable companies, but the actual product itself has to have positive margins. And so, you know, when we first started Wild Earth, I mean, we had, we had a, a minus 17% margin. So we, we, we had to do a lot of work to fix our margins. And, and honestly, there were surprises that we just didn't expect. So one, one example of a surprise we didn't expect was that um, because we were doing direct to consumer, literally Wild Earth is delivered to your door, right? So you don't have to go out to the pet food store. But the problem with that is that um, there is no one in the US, there's no one delivery charge, right? Depends where you live. Um, we started to get weird things like, charges from FedEx or UPS because now it was an extra charge because they had to go up the stairs, right? And so now we have an extra charge for delivery and we're like, wait, why is that? Mm -hmm. And so that really affected our margins. And so we had to negotiate better and better rates as we scaled so that we could stop that type of like just adding in random fees, things like that, that just, you know, are not, especially when you're, when you're, you're a product focused founder, you're making a product and you, you, it's actually the entire supply chain that you have to consider to that customer's door. And then you have to learn those lessons. And so we've, I mean, honestly, to give uh, the credit to, to my co-founder, Brill, and her team, um, Abril Estrada, she, um, she's our chief product officer. And she's really built our infrastructure from the beginning, from the product all the way through to the experience um, and, and actually the logistics of, of how we get a product to a customer's door. Um, whether that's, you know, whether that's on Amazon, Chewy, whether that's wildearth.com, all of these things. And so we, we have, uh, we now have about seven warehouses throughout the U.S. and we're looking to have more across the U.S. And so, you know, now we finally have reach across the U.S. and Wild Earth is sold just as much in Los Angeles and New York as Austin and Dallas and Houston and Chicago and Raleigh and Miami, right? So, you know, we're very proud of that, that this is not just a a Los Angeles, New York product. This is really a US wide product. So, in terms of um, of impact, uh, you already touched base a little bit of like reducing the, uh, if I don't mistake, like 25 to 35 percent of the uh, meat consumption in the US. But do you think that uh, is there still like a room on your side with what you do as a product? Uh, any room for improvement? And what are the maybe the, the sustainability or maybe social metrics that uh, you have in place with uh, Wild Earth or something that most definitely, maybe... yeah. You know, with Wild Earth, you know, um, w- one of the inspirations behind Wild Earth and actually our name is that you know my vision is that we reduce the impact that we have on the planet enough that we can rewild certain parts of the world, right? So so that we reduce the footprint and so rewilding to me is something that's very important. Um, I I absolutely love seeing, you know, nature come back, right? After we've kind of decimated, cut the rainforest, cut the forest, and then, and then some incredible humans, and there's some, some great people out there who've actually done this hard work of rewilding, of supporting the wilderness to come back. And so, you know, how do we do that? And so part of our journey is first, we have to reduce the amount of meat consumption that happens in pet food. It's unnecessary. 
Uh, dogs do not need it. And actually we're working on a, a plant-based cat food formula as well, which is hundred percent nutritionally complete. So, so both dogs and cats <clears throat> would, would be a significant reduction in the footprint, uh, you know, for the, 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 the crops that we grow to feed the animals that we feed to our animals, which just, you know, it's just incredibly inefficient, but outside of that, um, and there's, this is, this is where I think we have, we have a long way to grow, um, is, you know, what about the packaging, right? And so with wild earth, you know, our vision is how do we get to the point where our packaging does not damage the earth at all. Right. And so, um, when we first launched, we didn't have the luxury of being able to have, you know, recyclable packaging and things like that. Now we do for all of our products, except for our dog food. Um, the dog food actually requires, uh, triplex plastic. So it's a special type of plastic that it keeps it, uh, keeps the moisture from coming in. Um, and so because of that, you can't really easily recycle it, but we have worked on all of our other products. So our treats, our supplements, all of them are recyclable. And so the vision is how do we get our bags, our dog food bags recyclable as well. And then eventually how do we get to the point where we can have compostable packaging? So it just has minimal impact on the planet. And so this is, um, this is a constant journey for us. I mean, it's something that we want to bring science to. Um, and what we also know is that, you know, from, from those survey results uh, for pet parents that were willing to feed a plant-based diet to their pets, 35% are open to it, but the other, the other 65% are not. So then how do, we, how, do we, how do we address that market? How do we serve that market of pet parents who, even though, even though dogs and cats don't need animal protein, they just need protein in their diets, whether it comes from plants, fungi, yeast, or animals, how do we serve them? And so, you know, we've been thinking deeply about cell-based meat and we're working on products for cell-based meat as well. And so the, these are ways of how do we go out there and, and use science to innovate um, and reduce the impact of what we feed our pets and how we feed our pets on the planet. So... Uh... Today, like uh, I like to ask you also, that's uh, how the community of uh, of listeners could uh, could help you. What uh, what do you need? Uh, how, how can we help you to uh, to achieve your your vision and this exciting uh, exciting project and, and mission that you have? Yeah. So I so I think we're all on the same journey, and I appreciate whatever anyone does. I always appreciate it. Whatever you can do, it's always appreciated. Um, we would love if you have a dog at home. We would love for you to try Wild Earth. Just try it. Give it a chance. Give us a chance. Uh, it helps us in our journey. Um, we we would love if you could spread the word as well about Wild Earth. Most people don't even know that plant based dog food is possible or that dogs are omnivores. So there's just a lot of education. And we're a small company. We're doing everything that we can to really uh, educate the consumer that that there it is possible to to have a very different type of product that can help the, the planet. And it is not waste. Pet food is not waste. It's actually, um, you know, it contributes heavily to uh, the impact of factory farming. And so, you know, I would ask for, for, for your listeners help in that. And then, and then separately, you know, as someone that cares deeply about all of our impacts, you know, I would, I would challenge your listeners who are thinking about doing great things, you know, whether it's for pets or whether it's for humans, um, you know, we need everyone and their vision Uh, to create change. So whether that's nonprofits, whether that's, you know, just doing individual things, let, let us know too. Like if we can with Wild Earth, one of our recent initiatives is uh, the Wild Earth team members went out and collected trash, right? In your area, we, like our Wild Earth team members, we, we went out and we collected trash in our areas, just clean up the environment, like get the plastic away, right? So, um, you know, we want to be part of a holistic solution. And so we're always looking for partners Uh, to, to do great things. Like one, one thing that I'm, that I'm actually, I'm looking for someone, potentially a partner, and might be one of your listeners, is I want to try and figure out how we can help uh, with um, reforesting um, the world, right? And so how can Wild Earth help? You know, and maybe it could be a donation that every one of our, of our pet parents with a bag, we can actually do to help reforest different parts of the world. And so, you know, that's something that I'm thinking deeply about. That's something I would love some help with and some suggestions about it yeah and i think i have a i have a suggestion if you uh listen to uh, our previous podcast this company called uh, tridon yep. uh they're, they're from italy and uh definitely they can uh, potentially help you on that and happy to uh, to make the connection we'll um, love that. We'll love that. any question that i did not uh, ask you and that i should have um for this part of the show for this part you of the show yeah i mean so so there's so there you know Um, 
th there's actually a really interesting uh, thought, right? And, and this, is, this is something that's kind of aligned with sustainability, um, but it's something that you know, very few people are talking about, which is that both India and China, not only is their human population growing, but so is their pet population. It's growing dramatically, 20% year on year. And so both India and China will be bigger markets in both Europe and the US for pet food. And so you know, this really is a global need. So um, you know, I think as we're going forward, this is not just a solution for for Europe, for the U.S. Um, our vision really is how do we how do we serve and how do we feed billions of animals on this planet for Wild Earth? Um, but I think that there's an opportunity for everyone to help. You know, I think all of us that care deeply about animals know that in many parts of the world, um, you know, animals aren't treated well or with respect, right? You know, there are many stray animals, and so you know, part of our mission is we care deeply about the animals themselves, and so. You know, um, I, my, I, my vision is I want to help as many animals as possible, not just in Europe and the U.S., but globally. Uh, I, I, I get lots of emails, uh, unfortunately, from people outside of the U.S. and outside of Europe who want help with like they have sanctuaries for dogs and cats. I want to help them. We're just not big enough to do that. Um, but the, really, the vision is how do we scale to serve billions of animals and billions of pet parents as well? Thank you so much, uh, Ryan. It was a pleasure to have you uh, here today. Uh, really like a lot of uh, interesting insights. Um, amazing company that you're doing. Your story is uh, just uh, fabulous. Uh, thank you for being uh, generous with your time.